Hi, my name is Edit320, and I really, really like tanks. So much so, in fact, that I've decided to embark on a journey across the internet and gaming world alike to find some of the wackiest, coolest, and best-made tanks in video games. I'll be looking at everything from the plausibly realistic to the downright insane. Hey, can we kill tanks? Are we able to do that? Is that like a thing that we uh, have only ability to do? Like only from the rear? All right, let's give this a shot. Move ahead, we're gonna kill a firefly. <laughs> it was an honor. <laughs> so, if this sounds like something you're interested in, stick around and listen up. Because this is A Tank Enthusiast Reacts to Tanks in Video Games. You're good. You're good. Oh you're good. My. You're good. I do not like this. You're good. I do not like good. I can't turn the other direction. You're good. Do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> you know who you're talking to, kid? You're talking to Edit320, bitch. How's it going, ladies and gentlemen of the World Wide Web? It's your boy, Crazy Hair Edda here. I got some real crazy hair today, guys. Aren't I so wacky and uncharacteristic? No, not really. I'm actually a pretty normal guy. Welcome back to another episode of Tank Enthusiast Reacts, where today I'm going to be taking a look at Hell Let Loose. Uh, this is a game that's been on my list to check out for quite a while now. Uh, it's also one of those games that I did not own until I did the research for this video. Not only did I record myself playing this game, but I live streamed it. For those of you who don't know, I don't tend to promote it very much on this channel, I live stream every Saturdays at 5 p.m. EST. I go live on my second channel, Edit 320 Live, where we live stream. The only reason I'm really stressing this is because in some of these clips you'll see my little face cam with chat beneath it, and uh, I just don't want there to be any confusion. Uh, in case you're curious, this was live streamed, that's why. But I think I've taken up enough time with the two intros that these videos tend to have, so let's just hop right into the tanks. Did I just blow up a Panzer IV with a frag grenade? I think I just blew up a Panzer IV with a frag grenade. So, in our first clip here, uh, I managed to capture myself. What I do believe was me destroying a Panzer IV with just an average frag grenade. Now, in an ideal world and in an ideal scenario, you would have an anti-tank element with you of some kind. So this clip does beg the question, should you bother throwing average frag grenades? And according to official US training material, Yes, you should. There is a great video out there uh, entitled Crack That Tank, which is a genuine, you know, 1940s era training video on exactly this, what to do when your infantry encounters a tank. The video itself is kind of framed interestingly in that it's like a conversation between you behind the camera and some dude at a bar who kind of stares a little bit too deeply into your eyes. In this training video, this official US Army training video for World War II, they mention that it is a perfectly viable option to throw grenades or uh, grenadier riflemen. They specify actually in that, that grenadier riflemen uh, should be engaging this tank. They're stressing taking out optics. However, I don't think I've ever heard of a scenario where a frag grenade single-handedly blew up an entire tank. Uh, people in the comments will come in and talk about those frag grenades that get dropped down the barrels. That can be done. Even if you do that, there's a number of factors at play. The main one being whether the breach is open when the grenade goes in. So obviously, if the tank is in the middle of a reload, perhaps, and the breach is open, and you shove that grenade down the barrel, that grenade can roll all the way down the barrel into the turret basket, or into the tank, uh, and explode. And that could cause genuine damage. It could kill the crew, or it could blow up ammunition, or, or do a whole number of things. This has happened. There's literally footage of it out there. You can go out and Google. Um, I think there's one famous clip uh, out in the Middle East of somebody shoving a frag grenade into, I think it was like a T-62 or something, or a T-55, uh, and it it goes up. So if you're going to try something like this, you kind of want to see if you can catch the tank on a reload, and then run right up. There it is, Panzer IV! Hooray! A Mark IV. That's, that's this is a G, obviously. So the first tank to look at in Hell Let Loose here is the Panzer IV, which is fitting considering it's the one that we just went up against as infantry. Uh, this one is an Ops G. Uh, you can tell because it has the longer 75, but also uh, no Schutzen. So one thing that instantly strikes me about the way Hell Let Loose handles its tanks, and of course, 
Comparisons to Postscriptum are abound, especially because I already love Postscriptum in the way it does tanks. I talked before in my Postscriptum video about how I do like when tanks have asymmetry, the idea that not every tank has all the same features as another, as they did in real life. Real life doesn't care about game balance, and history doesn't often happen in accordance to what video games are going to be made about it afterwards. Postscriptum had some of this. It did take some creative liberties with how periscopes worked and, and where some things were on the tank, but I can tell you right now that Hell Let Loose does this even more so. You are either down, looking through a solid brick periscope, or you can pop up, not sticking your head out of the tank, but you have this periscopic scope in which you can rotate around to get all around field of view, and you have this sort of generic uh, crosshair in the middle. Needless to say, to get the nerdy stuff out of the way, the Panzer IV never had this. Uh, the commander did not have his own periscopes on the Panzer IV, he just had the vision blocks around in his cupola. Um, if the commander wanted to get any extra vision of that, he'd have to pop up out of his hatch. You are either sitting on your seat, buttoned up, or you open the hatches and then you're standing on your seat, peeking out of your hatch, you are incredibly exposed, and if you aren't peeking out of your hatch, you're buttoned up, locked up inside. I've also heard and read a lot of reports that a lot of commanders, even on German and Russian tanks, would keep their hatches open during battle, even if they weren't peeking their heads out, because there, there is a claustrophobia to it. I mean, if you're inside of a tank and you're getting shot at, and you know that any minute a round could sip through your armor, set off some ammunition, and you could go up in flames, that thing above you, you don't want it to be shut and locked. It's part of the reason why things like the Panther's uh, cupola, where the only way to open it is to, it's a mechanism, and you can't just open it with your strength, you have to have this little crank below you, and you have to spin it while the hatch slowly comes up and slowly rotates out of the way. So, I would imagine, and I'd be willing to put money, that a lot of Panther commanders in World War II left that hatch open. How horrible it must feel during combat to have to be like, all right, closing the hatch, and then the hatch comes and goes in and seals up, and you know that the only way that's getting open again is if you crank this fucking knob. I, I can't imagine the, the feeling of being sealed inside that you must get in a Panther doing that. Panzer III and Panzer IV were generally some of the most ergonomic tanks in the world at the time of their debut, but, I mean, you know, when you're in 1944 and your hatches don't even have periscopes, you know, that's kind of, that, you're, you're kind of falling behind. Directions, yeah. yeah, you'll fit, you'll fit, as long as you, Whoop. like, turn it a bit, okay. Ah. Turn, 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 oh. turn it. Oh, mama. Turn, turn you're, good. Oh you're, good. Oh you're good, you're good, you're good, you're good, like you're good, I do not you're like good, you're good. The Panzer II, uh, Lush, or Lush, or, um, I don't care. So what's interesting about the Panzer II L here is that it's basically a complete redesign. You can look at the evolution of the Panzer II from A all the way to the K, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L. Just making sure I know my alphabet. So to kind of really briefly summarize, the Panzer A through F is sort of like the main production variants that you think of when you, when you think of a Panzer II. They are that classic Panzer II silhouette with the leaf spring suspension, but projects did exist as early as 1938 for upgrades, modernizations to the Panzer II. Uh, the D and the E come to mind, where you throw a new engine in it and you give it torsion bar suspension, but the E never saw combat and the D the D was built and did see combat, but then they ended up turning them all into the Martyr II. And then that leads into the Alster G, which has uh, an interleave road wheel design, uh, an improved new turret. In 1942, they're working on the H and the M. Those never actually ended up leaving prototype either. There were plans for a Panzer II J, which would have 80 millimeters of frontal armor and 50 millimeters of side armor and turret armor, which is limiting insane. I don't know why a Panzer II needs 80 millimeters of frontal armor, but whatever, far be it from me. But what all of this development and flip-flopping, what it leads into eventually is finally production of the Panzer II Alf L. It has the interleave row wheel suspension system introduced in the G. It has the newer wider turret uh, and is actually capable now of a four-man crew rather than a three-man crew. Uh, and I did actually make a mistake in the postscriptum video where I said that the Panzer II had a one-man turret. It actually had a two-man turret. You had your commander who was also the gunner and then your loader slash radio operator and then the driver down in the hull. Now the Panzer II L gives you the chance to have a gunner, loader, driver, and radio operator, which of course creates an interesting roadblock here in Hell Let Loose because clearly we have the commander and the gunner being two separate people. And of course, while the Panzer II L does have the unique and cool factor, um, it is worth mentioning that between 1943 and 1944, only about a hundred Panzer II Ls were ever made. I do not want to, can I get out, you think? Well, there's smoke, I'm gonna try to get out and repair. Ah. Uh, yeah, we're basically right on the hole. Wait, how do I repair? Do you have a repair? I don't I think it's think I've got a shovel and that's it. <laughs>
It is also worth mentioning, at least in my opinion, kind of the repair mechanics you have going here. Uh, from what I was told, that you need to reach a certain level with your character to unlock like the loadout of a tank crewman where you have repair tools. Needless to say, that's not realistic at all. Every single crew member would be taught how to repair and remediate specific things on the field. Obviously, there comes a point where there's too much damage and you can't repair and you have to return back to the attached uh, engineering and support assets. The tanks are going to carry all of the tools that you need to repair, you know, do some basic maintenance on your tank and repairs on your tank, especially like if for a lot of the more common stuff like blowing your tracks. You know, you wonder what all of those stowage bins, boxes and stuff are for on, on tanks. It's not just to store personal crew supplies, but also, you know, that's where your wrenches, your shovels, track jacks and track tensioning tools are, are carried on the tank. It's all there for you. So you should never end up in a situation where a crew member does not have uh, the materials to repair a tank on the spot. So not only did it subtly frustrate me that I, for some reason, wasn't a high enough level to repair the tank, which is, a, I feel like, a pretty basic thing that you should be able to do in a game like this, but it's also not historically accurate, so I can slip that in there. Hey, can we kill tanks? Are we able to do that? Is that like a thing that we... Uh, ability only, from from kill tank. only from the rear? All right, let's give this a shot. Move ahead, we're gonna kill a firefly. That's something. Oh, oh there's, there's tank, there's tank, there's tank. Left, 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 full left, hard left stick, hard left stick. Shoot his ass. Shoot him. Oh my god, he just fucking got in. He's traversing. Go, go, go. Move, move, move. Keep going, keep going. We're gonna circle his ass. Circle the ass. Keep going. Yeah, in a Panzer II versus Cromwell engagement, the Panzer II, at this distance, should be able to do at least something. I mean, definitely take out the tracks and probably get through the rear, but even with armor-piercing ammunition, I'd reckon that the, the Cromwell is going to be a little too heavily armored. That, yeah, that engagement probably played out exactly as it would in real life. Uh, <laughs> well, also, maybe we, we tried our best. Cromwell rip me. Got a crummy, man. Oi, bruv, pull up, pull up in the fucking crummy. <laughs> Oh, bruv, pull up, man, in the crummy, yeah? Ooh, that sounded rough. That's that meteor engine in action, though. So, we also have the Cromwell in this game, just like we did in Postscriptum. And uh, the model doesn't look too bad in terms of kind of the physical detailing. Uh, the textures are a little bit... Uh, undefined and it's really really dark it's very very like deep almost like black olive green which is contrasting very aggressively with the uh, division and unit markings we have on the back of this British tank which we can see a, uh, a white triangle and a blue and green number 45 in, in, in that box. Blue and green number 45 is gonna indicate that this is an armored reconnaissance regiment, and the white triangle is to show that this is uh, a squadron. But then that yellow circle with the, the helmet and the wings coming off the back, that is the insignia of the Polish, first Polish armored division. Did serve with American and, and specifically British forces during World War II and, and on Normandy, they were there, much like how the French uh, also came back in Normandy. You know, that was supposed to be this big retaking of Europe so all these nations that's militaries like sort of still existed been exodus back to back to the UK and we're now coming back through Normandy to take back their land and again going back to the hell let loose's weird periscope system when you are the commander and you are hunkered down buttoned up so to speak and you're looking just through your straight vision port that is real the commander's hatch on the top of the Cromwell did have a, a singular uh, fixed in place periscope that you could look out of but then once you pop up and you're in the periscope view uh, all of a sudden you switch to the other side of the tank so now you're like clipping with the gunner I think that's kind of supposed to somehow represent the gunner's periscope that he has in that spot but it's also a fixed periscope and it would not rotate and it wouldn't be like a single round thing. It would, it would be just like the commander's one where it's just a single block for the gunner to be able to look up and see out through the top of the tank and then drop down into the gunner sights to actually take aim and fire. But yeah, it's, it's, it's especially pretty jarring where jumping from buttoned up to periscope, uh, you are jumping between the two sides of the tank and the commander would have been sitting behind on the left side of the tank behind the loader. It is worth giving credit though that as far as I can see all of the uh, scope reticles for the tanks in this game are very accurate. Oh, even oh, no, though I cool, definitely man. have the I have the money for it. It's just it's fucking stupid for some reason. What is that sprocket? Don't don't, don't feel uh, morally obligated to donate to the Patreon, man. It's it's no big deal. All right, and of course, if we're playing the British, we're going to have to do the Firefly. So far so good on the macro. Some minor complaints I have is with the sprocket. That is it doesn't look anything even remotely like any Sherman Sprocket that I've ever seen. They did get that it's an A4, which is fair. Uh, most vast majority of Fireflies were built on Sherman A4 Shermans with the Chrysler Multibank on them. The three-piece transmission looks good. The 17-pounder looks good. Although I would 
prefer if it had that camouflage on the front half of its barrel. That was a very popular thing that British crews did to hide the fact that they had the longer barreled Firefly tanks because at the time of the Firefly's introduction, there weren't any other uh, upgunned Sherman tanks on the field. So the British knew that German tank crews would, would look out for them first. And uh, painting the front half of your barrel in that sort of white wavy camouflage scheme uh, became a very popular and quick solution to this. It doesn't look like much up close, but when you're really far away, it genuinely does work. And interestingly enough, uh, this practice became so popular amongst British tank crews that they actually just started doing it on tanks other than Fireflies. And as far as I know, they did it all the way up until Centurion. Those tracks are uh, a bit weird. Firstly, there's the obvious lack of guide horns on the other side of the track. The Sherman's tracks would have needed guide horns on both sides of the tracks to keep it kind of sandwiched between them. The Sherman tank did not use uh, center guided tracks until they switched to HVSS suspension and you doubled up on road wheels. You are gonna throw your track super easily. So when it comes to Firefly gameplay, this is the first tank we've seen so far that genuinely has some credence towards a little rotatable periscope on top because the Sherman's hatch had uh, built-in periscopes in, in the hatch doors. Again, Postscriptum kind of did it better because you actually have your vision block that you're rotating rather than like this weird circular periscope that, that the Sherman didn't actually have. Also, your periscope isn't in the right spot. It's like kind of in the middle of the hatch and you can actually, you can actually see, if you look to your right, you can see the actual built-in hatch periscope that you would be using and should be using because of this weird effect where the turret kind of rotates beneath you and your periscope stays still. So like if the turret turns far enough, you're not even like on top of the hatch anymore. So all it's very haphazardly put in, I, I would say. My first major complaint of the Firefly gameplay is it is going way too slow. The Firefly was powered by the Chrysler Multibank. It was a 30 cylinder engine that could produce like 400 horsepower or so. Most Shermans, no matter the variant, had a average speed of at least 20 miles an hour, 20 to 20, 25 miles an hour. And this thing is going like probably half that speed at full max revs, full gear. Also, weirdly enough, the Sherman in this game has a four speed transmission when in real life it had a five speed. So there, there should be a fifth gear. Clearly they wanted to give some variety to the British forces. The Cromwell is the medium tank of the British. So the Firefly should be the heavy tank of the British in order to match the system they already have in place. So as is sort of the theme I'm detecting here in Hell Let Loose, in order to make the gameplay as fair, level to everyone, no matter what team or faction you're playing as possible, they're, they're, they're taking creative liberties. They're giving every single tank the exact same vision block periscope uh, viewing system for the commander, and they're giving every single tank the exact same. They're, they're forcing them all into one of three categories. One has to go in light, one has to go in medium, and one has to go in heavy. So I would have argued if you wanted a British heavy tank, you go for the Churchill, but then the heavy tanks that you're going up against in the Germans are the Tiger and the Panther, which again, the Panther being classified as a heavy tank is not correct. The Panther was a medium tank. It makes sense that they're trying to power scale the Firefly to be more equal, but neither of them are heavy tanks. They should be brought down to medium tanks. And I, I suspect that's also why the Firefly is so slow in these clips, is because it's a heavy tank, so therefore it needs to be heavy. I reckon this is something that the Hell at Loose community is well aware of, and I don't know if any of the players care enough to be bogging the devs about this, or if the devs do get emails every single day about people complaining about this. It's not game breaking, it's nothing crazy. I, I totally understand the need to, to create that level, again, that equal level playing field. Oh, that's cool, it's like water. Ah, and we finally have time to talk about the Russians, which uh, I love to see. I really like to see all fronts of the war represented and just the sheer variety that, that you get out of that. And here we got to look at the T-34. So uh, this is a 1942 model T-34. It has uh, kind of the earlier hull configuration where it looks like the front plate. When the T-34 was originally produced, it was one plate and they just took the plate and then just bent it around to fit that the curve of the front there. And you can imagine that with a plate that's 45 millimeters thick, they have face hardened armor, uh, heat treated to an insane degree. You can imagine that that got very time consuming to do. So pretty early on in the T-34's production, uh, they reconfigured the front hull to now be two separate plates that were joined by like a, a beam in the middle. And then eventually by the end of production, 1943, 1944, it's just straight two plates welded 
just straight onto each other, kind of representing that that simpler and simpler production style uh, that, the, that the T-34 goes through. Not too much nitpicking I can do on this model, to be honest. Well, I, I could, but it's all going to be really small things, like the, the view holes on the hatch doesn't look quite right. Actually, the, the, the front hatch in of itself just doesn't quite look right. But, uh, you know, I chalk all this up to just, you know, you're 3D modeling an entire tank. It's a lot of work, and I don't expect you to get it right every single time. I do sort of like kind of the impurities that we see in the armor, like all the scratches and diffs in it that we see. I don't know if diffs is a word. Soviet tanks were built with uh, very low quality steel. A lot of contaminants in their steel, but not just because of the way that they heat treated it and, and developed the steel. There's actually a great video series out there by a YouTuber called Mr. Hughes, who is currently restoring a T-3485. And one of the most recent episodes they posted was them aqua blasting. It's basically a different version of sand blasting the tank. The raw steel should be, you know, bright white, bright silver, uh, very clear, clean metal. But after aqua blasting this T-34 tank, they noticed that there were tons of black spots. Those are the impurities in the metal. Casting was poor, or they hadn't quite uh, gotten all the slag off the metal after it had been uh, after it had been heated. But then you can also see certain parts of the tank are high quality steel. Things like the barrel, things like the hatches, things like uh, structure points, weld seams. They were the ones that they bothered to properly treat the metal. And I think the Chieftain says it best. Where the T-34 needed to be made well, it was. And where it didn't quite matter as much, they didn't. Continue reversing, continue reversing. Trevor's right. Uh, left stick, left stick, left stick. We're getting satcheled. I'm jumping out. I'm taking a big risk. I killed him. I killed nice. him. Nice. Uh, wait, hold on. Do we have a satchel on us? Hold the tank. Hold, 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 hold. Uh, it's a satchel. How long do we have before this satchel goes off? 30 seconds. Fuck. Please. <laughs> oh. Holy shit, I almost creamed my pants. Wait, so in our T-34, we encounter a, a very stressful situation where I had to hop out of the tank last minute and spray somebody down who was putting uh, an improvised explosive satchel charge onto our tank. It was definitely in manuals of various armies to improvise potential anti-tank measures. However, it is usually not encouraged for a tanker to hop out of his tank and, and shoot somebody doing this. Uh, typically, you should have infantry support with you who's gonna help deal with this. If not, that is sort of what the pistol ports are for. Granted, the pistol ports are not great, and it's kind of the reason why we don't see them nowadays, but at least definitely here on the T-34, there are little plugs on the sides of the turret that quite literally what they were designed for was you would push the plugs out and they would be attached on a string, so they would just sort of dangle, and then you would stick the barrel of your revolver out and shoot whoever was out there. Obviously has its own downsides of, since it's a hole, you don't really have much room to maneuver that gun, so I can obviously see why that's not represented in the game, but it would be kind of cool. I have yet to see proper use of pistol ports uh, represented in, in, any, in any tank game ever at all, actually. They're always decorative, they're never actually usable, uh, but situations exactly like this, are the reasons why pistol ports are developed. Towards the end of the war, most nations realized that pistol ports were kinda dumb. Uh, in 1943, the US actually tried to get rid of their pistol ports on the Sherman tanks, but then in the middle of 1943, the crews came back and complained because they liked using the pistol port, the big square pistol port hatch on the side of the Sherman's turret. They liked using it for loading ammunition. And so in uh, like November-ish of 1943, the pistol port was added back in uh, to Sherman turrets. Theoretically move out. Wait. Uh, best, best F2. Wow, so we have the T-70 in this game as well. Uh, this is a really cool tank to see. It's a uh, Soviet 1942 era light tank, and really just not a tank you see very often at all. I think when we tend to think of Soviet era World War II light tanks, we think of the T-26, the BTs, uh, stuff like that. But the T-60, the T-70, that series of vehicles was very prevalent in, in Soviet forces and Soviet reconnaissance light tank forces. Interestingly enough, uh, the Soviets also used uh, the Valentine as a light tank. But the, the, the basis of the T-70 is that it was supposed to be better than the T-60. Big, big surprise, I know. The year is 1942, and the T-60 really does a lot of things poorly. Its armor wasn't up to standards, its gun wasn't up to standards, it wasn't quite fast enough for a light tank, it wasn't great for reconnaissance, it couldn't kill other tanks, it wasn't great for infantry support. They needed something new. It's 1942, we need something new. And so the T-70 was ordered. However, this is also 1942, and, you know, Barossa is in full swing. The Germans are on the doorstep of Moscow. Stalingrad is probably about to happen. I, I would need to remember the exact time frame. So it was stressed that we want to reuse a lot of the same components. So it, it fell into this weird gray area where, like, 
we want a completely new, modernized light tank for the Soviet Union, but we also have to make it as close as the old thing as we possibly can. So they can't actually improve upon it. They just sort of... They just sort of remake it. It ends up with a lot of the same problems the T-60 did. Uh, they did upgrade the gun to the 45, but it's 1942, and the Germans just upgunned the Panzer IV to have a 75 long anti-tank gun, and the Panzer III now has a 50 millimeter. So, thanks for playing. Nice job. A for effort. In terms of gameplay, I love having it in here. Uh, again, I think uh, we don't think of T T-70 very much when we think of Soviet light tanks, but it is a very important member of the family. However, it should be noted that, like most other Soviet light tanks of the time, the T-70 is a two-man crew. One guy in the hall to drive and one guy in the turret to command, fire the gun, reload the gun. Etc. We have three. We have the driver, the gunner, and the commander. I actually find that quite interesting because most issues in video games is not giving tanks enough crew members. I think it's quite funny that we have found a tank in a video game that has too many crew members. I don't know why, but I think that's funny. Oh, <laughs> and the IS-1. This is also a super cool tank to see. Very era appropriate. I actually would say that all these vehicles are very era appropriate if this is supposed to be like 1942, 1943. So the development history of the IS-1 is very incestuous with its predecessor, I, I should say, the KV series. It's Soviet heavy tank development in, in the mid-war is actually really interesting. There's a great video on the KV and the IS series of tanks by Red Wrench, who um, I would love to collaborate on a project one day, Red, if you're watching. In 1941, 1942, uh, the Soviets are drawing up a lot of plans to to revamp and redraw a lot of the tanks that they currently have in service. Uh, I've talked before in my T-34 video about the T-34M, and there were various versions of the T-34M as well, actually, that they kept redrawing it, and the, the, the decisions and decisions of what it would look like changed over time. And so actually, fun fact, the T-34M actually does end up, that, that lineage does end up becoming the T-43. So T-43 has its basis all the way back in the concept of this T-34M, and the KV is no different. I'm simplifying this by a lot. But the point basically was, in the attempt to make the KV more universal, they developed the KV-13. KV-13 has its own problems and doesn't quite work out, but the, the hull of the KV-13 gets a new turret plonked onto it. Uh, it's all very, like, it's really mix-matching. It's almost like Cursed Tank Simulator levels. Uh, they're just taking chassis and turrets and guns and just flopping them all around, and you get all these crazy different objects designations for wacky wacky tanks uh, and it eventually ends up in in the is-1 three-man turret is a huge improvement you know basically the same way the t-34 becomes the t-34 85 you could say that the kv kind of becomes the is-1 with the 85 even though the kv 85 did already exist but they only made like 50 of them or something like that they made a very very small number of them god damn it Edda. maybe you should just like fact check that I just, I remember looking this up at one point and being like, holy crap, they did not make nearly as many of these as I thought. No, that's the fucking War, that's the War Thunder wiki. Oh, God. 143. So, yeah, they, they, they did not build nearly as many as they built, eventually, IS-1s. Which, again, just shows, like, the KV and the IS are all, it's just, it's very, very incestuous. I keep using the word incestuous because I think it's a fun word to say. But, yeah, I, I highly recommend uh, Red Wrench's video on, on the IS and on the KV, they are very, very, very interesting, and it's it's the type of tank content that I just love, which is just, like, developmental history, like, going from here to here to here to here, and, like, I love this sort of stuff. That's what interests me. Pretty well represented in the game. Um, I didn't quite get a chance to be in the gunner's position for a lot of these tanks, so I... I can't always attest to like the exact ammunition counts and the exact RPMs and speeds that a lot of these tanks can reach, um, unless it's a Sherman. In that case, I can probably call those things out. Right. I really have no complaints with this, other than the blanket complaints I have with all the tanks in this game of the, the periscope on the every tank is a three-man crew and, and, and all that stuff. But that's, eh, that, that's marginal. Get us to this part and uh, halt us on the hill here, uh, on, on mark. There's tank, there's tank, enemy tank, halt the tank. Halt, driver, halt. Got you, you see him? Goddamn tiger. It's a goddamn tiger. tiger. Put some fucking smoke in his face. Nah, just kidding. Shoot him with AP in the turret. Keep, shoot on ping. Good hit. Good hit. Fantastic hit, actually. Hit him in the turret. Shoot again on ping. Uh, I'm loading, I'm loading, I'm loading. Raj. No, you got it, you got it. He's gonna try to angle. Beautiful hit. Nice. Tiger is down. Tank destroyed. Right there. And a pretty awesome thing here that I was able to actually experience uh, killing other tanks in the IS-1. Particularly, we end up destroying a Tiger tank, a uh, Tiger H-1 tank, which, yep, 1943, Battle of Kursk era. This is definitely a duel you would have expected to happen. They 
put the 85 into the IS-1 because of Tigers. Uh, it would be a tough fight, and the IS-1 could win, uh, for sure. And you know, now that I'm actually watching this footage back, it's, it's catching my eye for some reason on these Soviet tanks. Uh, turret Traverse, because this is a computer game, the turret is traversing by you hitting A and D, and you hit A, and then you initiate tur traverse, you hit D, you initiate traverse the other way, and so the effect that's giving you in the game is you're seeing the turret like just kind of like judder, it's kind of like bop, 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 and then when you hold it down you get that smoother traverse, and where in real life, especially on Soviet tanks, traverse is very loose. Uh, it's, it's quite quick, but very uh, slippery, it's got acceleration to it. Turret kind of starts spinning, but like it slowly goes up and then starts spinning, and then when you let go of the traverse, it has that momentum, it's the continuous swinging until it slowly comes back. To, to none. The electric motors in Soviet tanks have a very distinct whine to them that I think would feel very at home in this game, but it's not there. Every single turret has like the exact same traverse sound effects, and like, and I, you know, I get, like, you can't always go out and get the exact correct sound effects for the turret traverse of every single tank, uh, but I, I think it's important to note that uh, tanks do sound different in all aspects. For all the tanks that have like very distinctive and recognizable engine sounds, I think they got them right. Like particularly the T-34 has one of the most distinctive engines. I'm not really sure why I'm bringing a lot of this up. It's, it's negligibly important. Although I guess to me, it's important. Reverse, reverse, reverse. I think there is. They are off that stairs. Yeah, it's, a loop. Too. it's a loop, it's a loop, it's a loop. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. He's like there, he's like there. Load AP. Actually, I think I see him. Load AP. He's like there on ping. Try to hit ping. Oh, yeah, that is him. That, I see his turret traverse. Good hit. Good hit. Good hit. Good hit. Yep, one more and he's down. Solid hit, he's down. Awesome. We got him. We got him. All right, I think that's just about it for this episode of Tank Enthusiast Reacts to Hell Let Loose. Uh, this was a really fun game to try out and play, uh, very similar to Postscriptum, so I kind of picked it up and got into the rhythm of it pretty easily. If you haven't already, join the Discord, leave a like, subscribe, all that fun YouTube stuff. And uh, if you care to, you can donate to the Patreon as well, where all of your money will go directly back into funding this particular channel, helping me buy new cameras, buy a new tripod, buy upgrade to my computer, buy anything that will help me produce higher quality videos for you guys. We already have a list of people who have decided to join the Patreon. Thank you very much to all those people who, who are supporting me. But otherwise, if you're not going to do any of that stuff, at the very least, thanks for watching. And um, I will see you guys in my next video. Keep happy, keep tanking, something, 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 outro. How's it going, everybody? Crazy Etta. Crazy Etta? I am crazy. No. I was crazy once. They stuck me in a room. A room full of tanks. The tanks made me crazy. Crazy? I was crazy once.